I'd like to do a two or three part video series on troubleshooting some basic refrigeration equipment, um, walk-in coolers, freezers, go over the controls, um, go over troubleshooting the compressor, and go over what your, you know, normal operating pressures, temperature, superheat should be. Everyone troubleshoots differently, but I mean, we're all trying to get to the same goal is to obviously get the equipment fixed. <clears throat> First and foremost, of course, whenever I go and look at something, I like to check my, uh, I go inside, check my evaporators, make sure there's no ice on them, make sure they're clear of ice. If they do have ice on them, obviously you're going to thaw it out hopefully it has electric defrost and then check your fans make sure all your fans are running and make sure they're running the right way I've had a couple issues where two or three fans replaced by someone else were running backwards and you really have to you know use your eyes and try to catch some of those things before you try to move forward and diagnose whatever issue you're having then when I get up to the roof you know just do a visual inspection that's you know pretty key check your condenser coils sometimes they don't look dirty but you know just because they don't look dirty doesn't mean that they aren't dirty and just you know visually inspect all your electrical connections wires Make sure you don't see anything burned. Check your contactors. Make sure something's not pitted. You know, pretty bad. And loose connections also will give you a headache. Your fuses. Want to make sure all your fuses are good. And you know, that's basically the first step. Would be to just a visual inspection. Make sure you don't see any oil stains. You know, indicating a leak. Just doing that, it's going to, you know, help you narrow in on, you know, really what could be going on with the system. These are three um, condensing units for a cooler. They keep it around 35 degrees. They have uh, two evaporators for each condensing unit. And let's go over some of the controls that they have. So, you're going to have a thermostat, of course, which is going to control the room temp. It'll have a differential, you know, you set it to 35, or this one set to 35, and you can change the differential to, to start and stop, or it's usually 2 to 3 degree differential, meaning, okay, you set it at 35 reaches 35 degrees and then it's not going to turn back on until it reaches say 37 degrees so anyways your thermostat is in series with your liquid line solenoid which is right there and you have your defrost clock Your defrost clock controls your, this one says fan, but doesn't control your fan. It has, on typical systems, three would be for your defrost. One and N is the power to feed the clock. X is your defrost termination. It'll kick it out of defrost at around 50, 55 degrees. There's a sensor down on the evaporator. N four would be uh, for your it'll go through your thermostat and through your liquid line solenoid and four will also go for your evaporator fans so here's my fan delay in action my contact is just a little bit light but anyways typically on 
freezers, or low temp coolers. Your fans will not energize until they get a bo uh, below a certain set point, whether uh, usually below freezing, so you won't uh, blow any moisture off the cold into the space that can defrost. It's around 30, 25 degrees. Once your coil, there's a sensor on the evaporator coil, one of the u bins Once your coil temperature is below that, a little clicks on switch will close and pass power to your contactor coil or your fans. However, it's set up to energize your fans. So just keep that in mind also. If you don't see your fans running, it could be because your coil temperature is still a little bit high. So just keep that in mind. Uh, one and two are jumped out on this one. Basically, either two and four will be normally closed, and then whenever you set your pins for whatever, these are your fail safe time. Say you set it for 30 minutes. Once it, this arrow will reach your, your those pins that you have open. 2 and 4 will open and 2 and 3 will close so now you'll be sending power to 3 which is for your defrost heaters and it'll go through your auxiliary on your contactor coil so it will not energize your defrost heaters contactor coils until the contactor is open that's the way it's set so that way you're not bringing your heaters on while your compressor is running Whenever your system's in defrost, you know, it's good. Good idea to check amperage on uh, all your legs to make sure one of your heaters isn't broken downstairs at, inside your evaporator. And uh, just make sure all your heaters are working because I've had issues where there's a few heaters on one evaporator that you know were broken, so we weren't heating up that coil so it was, you know it just wouldn't thaw out it would stay frozen and that just creates you know more issues down the line so always check your heaters check your fuses your connections and your, your amperage on your heater contactors or if you don't have a contactor just your you know heater wires so <clears throat> Whenever your thermostat is calling, it's gonna open your, it's gonna energize your solenoid and your suction pressure is gonna rise. Let's go take a look. I have this cover off over here. Low pressure switch is going to close, and that's in series with your high pressure switch, your oil safety switch, and that will energize your contactor coil for your compressor and your fan motors on this one. I'll show you on this wire diagram. Uh, normally you won't have a start stop uh, compressor switch. This one does. You have a most systems will have a if it's a larger system will have a transformer to step down the voltage for your control voltage to around 240 or 120. So you're gonna go do your compressor start switch to a terminal board. Go through your high pressure switch, low pressure switch, through your oil safety controller, M2 and M1 normally closed. That's going to energize your contactor coil. Your safety controller, your oil safety controller has a time delay and it has a, some are a little bit different, but this has an electronic oil pressure differential switch. 
switch and it's uh, monitoring your your oil pressure your net oil pressure which is your suction pressure or it's your oil pressure minus your suction pressure and you take the oil pressure on your oil pump of course and the differential is your net oil pressure and at startup it's gonna delay for 90 seconds to 120 seconds for the Centronics by the Centronic uh, Copeland's oil safety switches to make sure it doesn't shut down on startup and then we'll keep your contact or energized and hear your hear your uh, fan motors also in parallel and this is the fan cycle switch right here so that's you know your basic controls for your your compressor your fans your evaporators your fans are wired to your defrost clock your defrost heaters are wired to your defrost clock and this one's got a couple more relays because we have two evaporators for one uh, condensing unit but overall it's going to be pretty similar to what you're working on so say you get to a call and you you go to the system you know you check your evaporator to make sure the coil doesn't have any ice and you come upstairs or wherever your condensing unit is and you find your unit off Basically where I like to start is at my check for power, of course, make sure you have power. Then I like to go to your thermostat, make sure, you know, make sure your thermostat is calling. Then I like to go to my time clock and I will check between 4 and N to make sure I have a potential of either it's a 120 control circuit or 240 so I'll do that right now I lost my UEI meter <sighs> gotta get me another one so between 4 and 9 I should have 240 hard to tell but I got 250 right now my unit's not running because my thermostat is satisfied like I was saying earlier <clears throat> your defrost clock will feed power to your thermostat but my thermostat's open right now because it's satisfied as soon as I lower the set point it's gonna send power to my liquid line solenoid my suction pressure should rise and it should go through my high safety my high safety switch should be closed through my oil safety switch and through my and back to my contactor coil to one side and energize it the other side of your contactor coil should be wired to common so there you go my pressure switch closed I have to go back and forth because that cover is not open. But anyways, like I was saying, you kind of have two different circuits. You have a circuit for your thermostat and your solenoid, your liquid line pump down solenoid. And then you have another circuit for your contactor coil. Once your pressure rises, um, your settings will vary depending on what you're working with freezers will usually cut out at 5 cut in at 20 you know coolers can cut out at 15 cut in at 35 just depending on what you're working with but usually you can see your setting your cutout is cut in less differential 
as soon as your suction pressure rises, your set of contacts inside your low pressure switch will close. This is a, a low pressure, high pressure switch, um, two in one kind of. Sometimes they're separate. But anyways, as soon as your low pressure switch closes, your high pressure switch, you know, should be closed unless you have a issue. Some are manual reset on the high pressure switches, your high pressure controls. Some are automatic reset. Usually, typically for 404A, they're set around 400. So, like I said, in this, for right now, it's closed because we have no issues. So, we're going to pass power through to my oil safety. Your oil safety has a, a set of normally closed contacts, M2, M1. Some are labeled different. So, those are normally closed, so you should continue your circuit back to your contactor coil and should energize. The first thing uh, I would look at is your, your oil safeties and your pressure controls if your compressor is not running and you are getting power to your thermostat and your solenoid. You now you can throw on a, a gauge and check your suction pressure to make sure your suction pressure is above your, your cut in. Then go ahead and check your, make sure your uh, contacts are closed and go through all your safeties. Like I said, this will have a time delay for around 90 seconds. Here's your sensor. Pressure differential must be greater than 10. If it's not, your timer will start to time out. If it does not close within those 90 seconds, 100 seconds, your M1 and M2 will open and it will kill power to your contactor coil. Your compressor will stop running. And it's usually manual reset, so you'll have to get up here, reset it, and then you'll have to investigate further on why the oil pressure, why your sensor locked out your compressor. You know, it could be low oil pressure, <clears throat> low oil in your crankcase, dirty strainer, um, a lot of foaming in your crankcase. Also, also be aware, say your compressor's running, but your compressor overheated and it went out on thermal overload, it will cause your um, oil pressure to trip. So it could be, it's a little tricky. It could be something different. You know, it could be, say you're low on gas and you have a high superheat and your motor will overload or you're coming out of defrost and you know, you have a, you're overloading the motor that way. So it's gotta be, mindful of those things usually they might sell sometimes they sell a current sense and relay to prevent uh, a nuisance trip on oil pressure if it, you know it possibly could be your motor overloading but that's usually what I check for Like I said, it's two, two different circuits kind of that you're looking at.